Good morning, Grace family. How are we? All right. Well, you sound good and you look good. I want to just uh, take about 31 seconds and continue that. And let's look at a quick video of some guys that also are excited about something that happened in our wider Grace Berean ministry this week. Let's check it out. so proud of those guys and their coach who was actually playing drums this morning. It's an awesome, awesome thing. I, t- I just said, and I'm so excited that, uh, that you guys showed, um, you waited to show the spiritual gift of mercy after the game, that you didn't show it during the game. So once you defeated and demolished your opponent, you can say, I'm here if you need uh, a shoulder to cry on. So uh, we're excited about what the Lord has done there. And uh, let me just give you a few heads up before we dive into our text this morning in Luke chapter 16. If you have your Bibles or you want to turn that on, open to uh, Luke chapter 16 is where we'll be this morning for our message. And as you saw in the video from Lindsay, who also did an incredible job uh, in our announcement video, starting point is today after the third service. And so I just want to encourage you from my heart to yours. I mean, we don't want you guys to just come and sit and, and not serve and not really know anybody and just be, uh, be an unknown factor, kind of come in and then leaving. Starting point is the way to get connected to the Grace community, whether it's a small group or whether it's a way to serve. And so if you've been here for any amount of time and you think, man, maybe, maybe this is the place for me to really, uh, to really uh, plant my roots and, and be involved with, come to Starting Point. It's after the third service, free lunch, free child care, uh, as we said on the video. Also, um, this is the second to last Sunday in our Who's Your One sermon series for 2020. And as we started a couple of weeks ago with this, it's a 30-day prayer guide. I want to encourage you that maybe you've been out of town, and if this is your first day back to grace even this year, pick up one of these, and you can begin today praying for your one, that God would give them a heart to want to hear the gospel when you share it. And then we have friend day in two weeks, right? We have Friend Day, and uh, so we're going to invite our friends to come to church with us. We're going to look at a message from God's Word in uh, 1 John chapter 4 about the nature of love, the nature of friendship, what actually makes friendship a thing, and how can we be the friends that we need to be with the people that we care about. We're going to see how God's Word answers those questions. So that's two weeks from today. Um, There are some of these, these little yellow invite special invite cards for Friend Day right there at the Next Center, uh, next Step Center as you leave after our service today. Also, this past Tuesday night at 7 p.m., Recovery Church started for the very first time uh, right across the street. And so, yes, it was an incredible, incredible time. Uh, we had, guys, we had for Recovery Church. This is for um, those of us that, that know someone or those of us that watching online or we're here and we, we struggle with with uh, drugs and substance abuse. We had 59 people come, 59 people come for the very first time. So we don't know what the Lord's going to do um, with that, but um, Phil Dvorak, who's, who's helping us lead this ministry, he's like, Jeff, we didn't even have any of the treatment centers bring uh, the people. And um, he said that... Um, Often for for weeknight meetings, for substance abuse, everyone in the recovery community uh, refers to to the vans and buses as, and this is not a disrespectful term, as druggy buggies. He's like, we had no druggy buggies tonight. He's like, so 59 people, and then once we start connecting more with the treatment centers or trying to help people come out and using every means uh, that that we have to help people recover, he's like, bro, this could get absolutely awesome. And so I just want to encourage you, if you know somebody uh, who would need this ministry on any level, why don't you invite them? And if you're free on Tuesday night, why don't you come with them? Maybe you want to come and help and serve. Listen, you don't have to have a background in recovery. You just have to love people. 
people. And so it was an absolute, absolute incredible blast. We had a, a recovery church band. Um, it, was a, it was a little bit different set list than on Sunday morning. And it was so much fun. I'm not even kidding. Like, it was an absolute blast. So if I have a conversation with you today and I'm going, what, what, what? It's because I was at recovery church on Tuesday night and the band was incredible. All right? So we're excited about what God's going to do there. And finally, beach baptism two weeks from today. Jesus told us, right, that when we follow him, we repent of our sins, we believe in him, the first step of baptism is believer's baptism by immersion. And so if you have even questions about baptism, just let us know on your connect card. We'll connect with you. And Lord willing, um, that will be an awesome opportunity to be baptized. The first beach baptism actually of 2020. You guys ready to go? You ready? I mean, not like go, not like church over, but like let's go. Let's reach Palm Beach County for the glory of Jesus Christ. Because the reason why is, is honestly... Um, some of us have struggled at some point with something called procrastination. Okay? Now don't look at somebody. Don't, don't point at somebody. But our question this morning is this. Are you procrastinating? The, the, the main line that we're going to try to drive home this morning um, is that there is an expiration date. And if there's an expiration date on your milk or a box of Wheaties, that's, that's an encouragement to say you can't procrastinate forever, right? Think about procrastination. Let's just define it real, real quick so we don't keep procrastinating the procrastination. The definition of procrastination is the action of, do we have that? The action of. Hey, there we go. The action of delaying or postponing something. There's also a word that we know of called tomorrow, and it's defined like this. A mystical land. We all right? Where 99% of all human productivity, motivation, and achievement is stored. That's how you define tomorrow, right? And we actually made a, uh, actually we found this, believe it or not, on the World Wide Web. Something called top 10 reasons why I procrastinate. And here's the list. But we just procrastinated to put all 10 down. We okay in the house this morning? Somebody will get that later this afternoon. You see, expiration dates are a subtle reminder that we have to utilize whatever it is while there's still time. And there may be some of us in this room that for certain things, we are on it. I mean, we are on it. Like, I mean, absolutely making lists, knocking things out, completing things on a gargantuan scale. We don't procrastinate anything. But in some areas, we procrastinate. My area of procrastination is fixing things around the house. I finally, after months, I finally fixed the screen doors this Friday. Because the Lord's like, you're talking about procrastination on Sunday. Fix the screen doors. And so we did that. Can I just ask, so we, we're a family here. How many of us have ever struggled with procrastination on any level with anything? Can I see your hand? Okay. All right. That's a lot of us. And again, we may be great in this area, but over here we procrastinate. And if you did not raise your hand, we are so glad that you have graced us with your presence. You just sit there and continue to be the awesome specimen of humanity that you are, and we will all try to attain your greatness. Was that too much? Are you procrastinating? We're not talking about yogurt or screen doors. Because there is something that has an expiration date on it. I mean, it's not really visible, but we know it's there. And so when we wake up in the morning or even at night and we look into a mirror, and what we see has an expiration date. But you know what? We, we don't know what the date is, but we know one is there. And so here's what I want to suggest to you this morning as we prepare to dive into this, 
this narrative that just packs together this story, this, this long, connected, a logical train that Jesus lays before us in Luke chapter 16, if we know that we all have an expiration date, and we know that everyone has an expiration date, and we're in this, this, this collective, this group, this family mission to say that each one of us can reach somebody this year for the glory of God. We can share the gospel with them at a certain point, or we can invite them to church. And again, Friend Day would be a great place to start here in a couple weeks to bring somebody here to hear the clear gospel of Jesus Christ. And if I have an expiration date, and they do, then Jesus has given us his gospel, his good news, that every single person needs to escape from something called the wrath of God, which is not a hot sauce, but it's the, it's the justice of God that is on every person outside of Jesus Christ. That's why we all need a Savior. There's only one who qualifies. His name is Jesus Christ. So if I'm procrastinating with sharing that, that life-changing gospel, the necessary antidote to our sin, then at a certain point, we all have an expiration date. And it's not our heart, just like the Lord, that anyone would perish. But we want everyone we know to come to a place of repentance and heart change before Jesus. So here's what I hope that you get out of the message today. That if you've been procrastinating so far this year, with sharing the gospel or encouraging someone to come with you to this place of worship where they can hear the gospel, procrastination for the follower of Christ is no longer an option. We good? And what we're about to read is not something that um, we often talk about in, in church today, and that's a separate talk, separate reasons for that. But here at Grace Fellowship, we want to be biblical and we want what Jesus actually said to be what we preach and Jesus actually talked about something quite a bit he talked about a place called hell and we're going to see from what Jesus told us that hell leads us to understand that for ourselves and our own relationship with God and also helping other people come to know God that procrastination is not a rational or reasonable option but for us to encourage people to come to Christ today and if we are the one that today can be the day of our salvation. Why procrastination is not an option. In Luke chapter 16, we see the rich man and Lazarus, who was a poor man, both died. Notice verse 19. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen, who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, this is... Even the dogs came and licked his sores. And this is not like, you know, tame dogs. It refers to wild dogs in the street. This guy was so poor, he had literally no ability to even provide for or protect himself. So Jesus gives this story of a man with an actual name. You know what's fascinating about the way Jesus begins this story? Is the rich man didn't have a name, but the poor man did. One of the great takeaways, and we're going to back up a few verses in a moment so we take this in context and we understand the fuller picture of what Jesus is getting at. A lasting legacy, please hear this, is first and foremost not on what you build or what you own, but on who has you. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you can have an eternal legacy. Well, right before Jesus begins this story, if you want to back up there in your Bible, he tells a story about a, a crooked, he tells a, a parable of a crooked manager. And this guy was a crooked manager. The owner of the company finds out. He comes to the crooked manager and says, I'm going to cut you loose. Here's the slip, and it's colored pink. The guy says, you know what, I've got to prepare for myself. I'm too proud to beg, and I'm not strong enough for manual labor. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to call in everybody who owns the owner of the company any money, and I'm going to slash that like it's a going out of business level sale. And so that way, I'm hooking them up now, so once I no longer have the job, like they'll be able to hook me up. 
And something interesting happens in the story. When the boss finds out what this crooked guy had done, the boss does not respond like the big boss in the Bruce Lee movies or like Don Corleone on The Godfather and says, okay, you, you pull one over on me, you're going to be sleeping with the fishes. He doesn't do that. What the boss actually does, it's almost like he's, he's nodding his head and it's like, you got me, bro. Okay. Well, Jesus told this story First of all, what is going on and what does Jesus want us to do with this bizarre story? Jesus begins in verse 8 to, to clarify the parable. And he says, For the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. Here's what Jesus is getting at. Jesus' point to this story as he begins to lay forth what we're to do with it is that people without God are usually better with their money than people who follow God because if you don't follow God, really the only God in town is your money or whatever the money can help you get. Why is that the case? Well, if you begin to think of the psychology behind wealth, the driver, the motivation for a person without God ultimately revolves around money at some level, where money is either the means to get security or power or fame. And if it's not all about the Benjamins, then the money is a stairway to get what we really want, which is one of the two most intoxicating realities in the universe— fame and power. So Jesus is saying that's the only game in town for those without God, so it follows that they're often better with it in terms of leveraging it. And then in verse 9, Luke chapter 16, Jesus begins to get down to brass tacks. He's about to lower the boom because he says, and I tell you. By the way, this is not on the screens, and the reason why we do this sometimes is to get you to open your Bible. Just want to drop that there and, uh, and just move right on. You can download it right now, free Wi-Fi. We love you very much. A lot of, lot, lot, lot of love, a lot of love in the room. We just don't want you to be dependent upon the screens 100%. We good? I love you. So Jesus says, and I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. Here's Jesus' point as he begins to make the bigger point. God gives us money to leverage for the greatest goal that we have in life, which is helping other people come to know who God is. We can't, hear this. We can't buy or bribe people into heaven with money. It's not the way it works. But we can use money to help the gospel get to people who don't have it. We can also leverage our money to create ministries and support ministries that help clarify the gospel by those who are confused by it. Well, how do these friends thank you in eternity? It's because the leverage of what God has given us to help them understand who he is allows them to experience the life-saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And then in verse 13, Jesus begins to bring it in for a closer. No servant, he says, can serve two masters, for he will, what, hate the one and love the other? And then he brings it even closer. He says, you cannot serve God and money. And then the clutch verse in the passage, verse 14, the Pharisees were listening to Jesus tell this parable, and it says the Pharisees who were lovers of money heard all these things, and they ridiculed him. So what Jesus was doing is he started to dig at the heart of idolatry and greed, and that was deeply implanted in the hearts of the Pharisees. And whenever somebody starts talking about your God, you push back, right? Like I know the Super Bowl is tonight, and whether you like uh, American football or for our soccer fans, you say that's actually real football because you use your foot, the foot and the ball. Like American football, you use the foot on the ball like 5%. Thank you very much. Like football, you have a ball and your foot. Thing. That's soccer, all right? Don't want to create divisions, but I just want to drop that out there. No matter what type of sport you like, when somebody starts to talk about your team, you're like, hey, don't talk about my team. This is like a million times greater because the Bible says that the Pharisees, what drove them, what their affections were wrapped all around and in was the love of money. And Jesus just exposed all of that. 
That's the background. That's the scene. That's the conversation. And then Jesus tells a real story about a rich man with no legacy and a poor man who had only God. That's the background. Does that make sense? Then Jesus gives us this story. You know what's interesting, and it's there in your notes as well, that the rich man's God, which was money, couldn't save him when he really needed a capital G God. When he really needed saving, what he had put his life into couldn't do a thing. Verse 24, we see more of a description on this place called hell. We see that hell is a place of suffering. Notice verse 24 says, And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus by his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus to dip the tip of or the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. He was in torment. But do you notice the way that the rich man doesn't even reference Lazarus? He doesn't even acknowledge that the poor man has any value other than send him to do this for me. Do you catch that? Like he's not, I'm not talking to you. You're not important. I'm talking to the big, big A. Like big Abraham, like you're important, I'm important. I talk, I talk to important people to get people who are not important to do things for important people. He's trying to, you, you see how this is bizarre? He's in hell and he's still trying to call the shots. That's why according to Jesus, this is a roundabout point to say that hell doesn't change a person's heart. Some of us have have thought that, well, when a person goes to hell, the response is going to be, God, I wrong, I was, I've been wrong. You know, I, I want to I do it over again. No, no, no. What hell does is amplify the heart condition that's already there. This guy did not even speak to Lazarus. All he wanted was relief. He did not seek repentance. And what God desires from us is repentance. What we want for our friends and for our family is for them to come to a place of repentance, which is to do a 180 and turn to God and turn from self. Hell is also a place of regret in verse 25. But Abraham said, child, remember. There's a way to say there is no prestige in hell. There are no titles in hell. There's no big shots, no high rollers, nobody who lives high on the hog. There's nobody that's a baller shot caller in hell. And so Abraham, the the original patriarch, refers to this man who could call any shot that he wanted to in this life because he had resources and connections. The first thing he says is child. Brothers and sisters, we could, know, we, we could know so much about so much. We could have degrees after degrees, but where the beginning of wisdom is, as the book of Proverbs tells us in chapter 1, is the fear of the Lord. It's the respect. It's the honoring of the one who simply is above all things. Hell is a place of regret. If you have more questions about hell, I, I encourage you to go on our website and check out our series we did last year um, in the month of March 20, 2019 on Heaven and Hell. It's a four-part series. We investigate the rationality of hell um, and the justice of hell and so forth. And so if you have questions, if it just doesn't really sit right, you are probably a Westerner. Most of the objections, is, it's fascinating when you look at this from a data perspective. Most of the pushback against hell are people from Western Europe and North America. But when you talk to the wider, the majority world Christians who have experienced in, like war and famine and deprivation, we have people in this church that have ple- fled atheistic, communist, communist uh, oppression. We have people in this church that have fled like Muslim militias trying to kill their family in Africa. And if you've lived outside the West, you've seen evil on a macro scale. And this may seem foreign to some of us that grew up right down the street in a certain style of home in a certain neighborhood. But actually, hell is a comfort to people who have been under the oppression of brutal regimes because they know that there is going to be justice one day. 
And if you were in an upper middle class North American or Western European and you have issues about hell, before pushing back against it, I would encourage you to have conversations with people who were born outside of where you were born and you will see that the justice of God is actually the guarantee that the oppressors will not get away with it forever is not an argument against the existence of God, but it's actually an argument for the existence of God because there is going to be a guarantee of justice one day. And so for those of us who were raised in certain contexts here and we just push back against that, let's be careful. Let's be careful that our reaction is not the reaction of our particular neighborhood or socioeconomic situation. Let's talk to people who have actually truly been under brutal, brutal oppression and seen things that would keep us up at nights for weeks on end. Knowing that there exists a God in the heavens who one day will bring every work into judgment is an encouragement. Not a reason to disbelieve in him. And if that sounds a little bizarre, again, you can go back and look at those messages and know that we're here for any conversation that you would like to have. Hell is also a place. Are we good? Now, this is kind of, kind of a heavy message, but what's different with the, today and any other week at Grace Fellowship. Hell is a place of separation in verse 26. And besides all this, Abraham says, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able and none may cross from there to us. Because hell is a place of ultimate separation and finality. Hell is a place of finality if we look at verses 27 through 31. And notice how the rich man who did not have God continued to try to call the shots even in hell. And he said, I beg you, Father, to send him. See, Lazarus is not important. He doesn't have a name. To send him, the person whose only value is to serve me. Do you, do you catch what's, what he's saying in between the lines? Send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them lest they also come to this, into this place of torment. Because this guy didn't want to be embarrassed. He didn't want his five brothers to come and be like, well, you, got, you told us this place doesn't exist. It's not because he cares about his brothers. It's all about him. And again, hell simply amplifies the heart condition that's already there. Verse 29, but Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. This is mind-blowing. And he said, no, Father Abraham. So he's arguing, like, like when you read the Bible, Abraham is like the Mac Diesel. Like he's, in, he's the dude. Like he's the first guy God called out and said, through you, the, through you, the Messiah will come and the chosen people. Like you are Father Abraham. And the rich guy in hell, whose only God in this life was his money, is trying to tell Abraham <laughs> that he's wrong. Do you see the arrogance? He says, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. If you give them a big fireworks show, then they'll repent. If you underline any verse, underline this, because this, this undergirds what we do here at Grace Fellowship a church for all nations. It's the power of the word of God. Check this out. He said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. Like, hold on. Like, if I, bro, if I'm, if I'm in a funeral and we're... And we're saying all the nice things because at a funeral you don't say anything about bad about the person. They never sinned, right, at a funeral. And so we're saying all that stuff. And all of a sudden they, they sit up in that casket. <laughs> or if we've already closed that casket, we hear some knocking from the inside. I'm not staying around for the miracle. I'm gone like yesterday is gone. Peace out, I'm gone. <laughs> come on, like coming back from the dead and be like, I, was, I saw it. It's real. Repent. Well, ah! 
I had like 5,000 baptisms in one day. Hurry, hurry, hurry. <laughs> Pastors having to go in for reconstructive back surgery, you know, and people sitting on the floors at church. I had to get back from the dead. And the funeral director's all mad because they're like, well, we, we can't charge them for the funeral now. I just, just lost money. But the nature of miracles, and I, I know, again, this, this, boy, this is a fun thing to talk about. We just don't have time today, a completely separate series. But the nature of the way that many of us perceive the miraculous, we may even believe that it's in the Bible, but it's not like you know, something we talk about every day. But go with me here. A true miracle like, like this, like the guy whose God was his money that he wants to fix all his family with, the nature of miracles is it's shock and awe, right? But, then, but a miracle can't change our hearts. A miracle can cause us to consider the source of the miracle, but a miracle in itself has never changed anybody. We even find embarrassing details in the Gospels of, like, these ten guys who had this deadly disease in that time called leprosy. Jesus heals them all. Nine walk away without even saying thank you. And now some of us with a spiritual gift of justice, like, I want to go back and give them the closed fist of healing. Like, say thank you to the man. How did your mama raise you? It's in the Old Testament. It's in the New Testament. All throughout Hebrew history, all throughout, all throughout our own lives. What Abraham is saying is that a miracle will momentarily shock our emotions, but the word of God, Moses and the prophets, which by the way, Jesus told the apostles, Moses and the prophets speak about me. So it all connects. The word of God gets into the basement of our heart and begins to appeal to our head, begins to appeal to our thinking, our worldview, what we believe to be true, uh, what we believe to be true about morality and about sexuality and about life itself and heaven and hell. And it also appeals to every aspect of our emotions. So what Abraham is saying is, you got it wrong, guy whose only God is your money. It's not that people need shock and awe. What they need is to come face to face with who they are and who Jesus is. If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they may experience a miracle and say, you know what, for 2020, we're starting to go to church. But if there's no heart change, it won't stick. Like they may go through a health scare and say, we, we've got to start praying. We need to, we, we need to go to church. But it won't last because the heart has not been changed. Does that make sense? So what Abraham is doing is echoing the words of God throughout the scriptures and most ultimately comes to the Lord Jesus Christ who came to save us from the inside out. And that's the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ he doesn't come to us and say, I want you to try to be better people, but I want you to recognize that you can't be what you need to be and to look to Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And in Jesus, we place our faith. And through Jesus, our hearts are washed clean. And we're made brand new from the inside out. Because Moses and the prophets speak of Jesus. So, again, to reemphasize, if Lazarus was not allowed to go back and tell others, then who will tell them? It's very simple. People who share the word of God. Because God's word is greater than an emotional experience. Miracles can move us towards God, but they can't change our heart. You know, I was thinking all of this past week that an instance that happened last Sunday with a young man that was an incredible athlete, incredible mental intensity, one of the greatest players to ever play the game of basketball. Three years into his retirement, worth $600 million, 
As far as the ability to handle pressure, his, his mamba mentality and how he trained other people to think, not just on the court, not just on the field, but in the business world as well. And an example of hard work and diligence, a guy who came straight out of high school and started dunking on, on guys who had been in the NBA for years. Kobe Bryant, last Sunday, ushered out into eternity. And guys, we never know where anybody goes. Don't, don't play that game. Don't play that game. But one thing that miracles and honestly untimely deaths can do is cause us to reflect, where am I with God? Where am I with God? And I'm going to ask all of us, I know many of you guys are just so faithful and you love the Lord, you reach out, but I think it's altogether appropriate today to say, Lord, where am I with you? 